uh, Hard Country, which happens to be the very title of uh, this book. Somebody used religious terms that signify, I think, the uh, thickness of the book, but perhaps also the comprehensiveness. I'm not going to use those terms, but uh, it is indeed a book worthy of uh, reading, and I'm sure many of you have uh, read parts of uh, or all of it. We're very happy to have uh, Anatole Liven, the author of this book, with us today. Uh, my name is uh, Christian berg Harpiken. I'm the director of uh, PRIO, the Peace Research Institute Oslo. This seminar is a collaboration between PRIO and uh, NORF, the Norwegian Center uh, for Peacebuilding. Um, and uh, I'm not going to share this seminar here today. I'm simply going to introduce Marco Macera from NORF. And uh, Marco and I have been uh, exchanging a few mails uh, on who should share the seminar. And I've been insisting that Marco should lead it, because he is actually somebody who is now not only based in Oslo, but he's based in Oslo and he knows something about Pakistan. And for those of you who work in Pakistan, you know how rare, how rare uh, a good that is. So that's something we value a lot. And I think it's very appropriate, therefore, that Marco shares this seminar. Marco is a senior advisor at NOREF, moved to Oslo very recently. He has uh, a multifaceted background. Uh, he's an expert on Southeast Asia, been working there for many, many years. His last position was at uh, Klingendal, uh, the Institute for International Affairs in uh, Holland. But he's held various positions, both in, uh, both in various European institutions and in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, Asia and in uh, recent years he has been following uh, uh, Pakistan very very closely with a particular focus on uh, governance and uh, democracy issues. So I simply hand the mic over to you Marco or you may use the mic that you have in front of you but uh, I'm grateful that you want to share the seminar that you volunteered in the end <laughs> after some push. <laughs> it's very appropriate and I'm looking very much forward to, uh, to follow it. Please, and welcome again. Thank you very much, Christian, and uh, thanks for everybody for being here. I am delighted to see there is a lot of interest, and it couldn't be differently so, because Anatole Levin is, of course, uh, a big name when it comes to Pakistan, and probably not only to Pakistan. And uh, it took us some effort, I must say, to get him here. But uh, now I think he's very happy also because it's the first time he c he's been in Norway. And although today the weather has not been uh, particularly generous with him, we have heard that tomorrow will be better. And so we look forward also to some out outdoor activity tomorrow, may maybe. Um, the idea was indeed to have this seminar uh, to present his book, I mean, the book that came out last year. Uh, but I think it's, um, there are very powerful arguments in this book, I think, especially the whole uh, um, uh, narrative around uh, the social structure of society, the kinship, kinship group that plays a very important uh, role and position in, in Levin's book. Uh, it's something that came out very strongly and it's, um, it's an eye-opener for indeed uh, people who want to understand Pakistan society in a more complete way. Uh, on the other hand, we also wanted to give the opportunity um, you know, to raise some of the issues, uh, to open up the discussion, because the book can not be all-inclusive, so we know there are always some things that people say, uh, I'm missing something, so we are crea creating the opportunity to maybe open up a couple of other spaces for discussion. And to do that, um, uh, as it has been structured, we have, uh, so in principle, a uh, half an hour presentation by uh, Professor Levin. And then we have uh, two discussions that will uh, address uh, uh, some of the issues, uh, each from their own uh, perspective. So on my left hand, uh, we have Hans Inge Lange. And I'm very sorry for the Norwegian pronunciation. I'm, I just arrived here, so I, I have to learn a little bit. Uh, but he said, well, just call me Hans Inge, which is a little bit more manageable for me. And he's from a researcher from uh, uh, NUPI, and he focuses mainly on uh, US security policies. And of course, South Asia being a, uh, one uh, very important aspect of that. And at my right hand, we have Har Arne Strand, uh, who's a director of research on uh, peace, conflict, and, and state at the Christian Mikkelsen Institute in Bergen. And um, well, Arne has been doing a lot of work, of course, through the years on Afghanistan and uh, touching also upon Pakistan. So um, I think he has uh, elaborated some points that I uh, would like to raise then on the discussion, again, uh, related to the book. 
So um, the idea then, after they uh, will have raised their issues, there will be some uh, feedback from uh, Professor Levin, and, and then we have about one hour, that's the planning, for all of you to you know, uh, raise issues again and, uh, and open up the discussion with Professor Levin. So I give you the word, Professor Levin, and good luck. <laughs> Thank you, Marco. Um, and I'm most grateful. Oh, sorry. Yes, of course. Um, yeah. And uh, many thanks to Prio and to Nora for inviting me. I'm, I'm most grateful and giving me the, the chance to visit Oslo for the first time. Uh, just two things to begin with. Um, one is that uh, the, the book was commissioned by Penguin at 100,000 words. Uh, the manuscript was handed in at 200,000 words, and God bless them, they accepted it and printed it. However, um, on the score of having to let leave some things out, um, of course, if I'd handed it in at 300,000 words, I think they might uh, have balked a little. So yes, I mean, certain things are missing. And of those, um, one thing that I particularly regret, which I wanted to put in there, uh, but there just wasn't... Um, wasn't space for it, uh, is um, I wanted to have a chapter on the Pakistani diaspora in the West, but the, there just was not the space or the time. Uh, also, um, I, ideally, I, I should have had um, more on the economy, um, but once again, lack of space. <coughs> uh, in this talk, I, I'll, I'll talk about the... Um, the book, which obviously has a lot of implications for Western policy, uh, but with the exception of the conclusions, is not actually about Western policy as such. Only the concluding section of the book has my recommendations, but I'm, I'm sure that we will discuss that in, in the course of, um, you know, of the discussion afterwards. So what the book is essentially about is power in Pakistan, within Pakistan. Uh, who has power, how it's exercised, uh, what its sources are, its sources in terms of social, economic, moral, and cultural and religious uh, authority. And um, the book uh, went through a number of provisional titles, some of which, in a way, describe it better uh, than the, the eventual title. The one which I still like best, because it's the most descriptive of it, but also I, I, I liked it because it was actually rather a bit provocative, was How Pakistan Works. That is another very good way of describing the book. I, I, I say provocative because, of course, the, the general feeling, both within Pakistan and among Western observers, is that Pakistan doesn't work. Uh, my view, as expressed in the book, um, is that Pakistan, in fact, does work very imperfectly no doubt, uh, but and very much in its own fashion. But nonetheless, that Pakistan is not in fact a failed state, nor necessarily a failing state, at least not in the short to medium term, although I am extremely concerned about the, the long term of the country. Um, and um, I take my epigraph not from any Pakistani source or source about Pakistan, um, but from Galileo Galilei, a pur si move, and yet it moves, um, with all the the problems and obstacles and difficulties, and yet it moves. Uh, the, the title, uh, Penguin, my, my publisher thought that, that uh, this title would confuse the audience so much. Then I came up with the second title, um, which I also liked, but which was indeed probably too academic. And that was uh, Pakistan, the negotiated state. Because a fundamental theme of the book is that in Pakistan, decisions, laws, processes, which I was going to say in the West, but I think rather it would be better to say in our image of the West, because actually there are a lot of parts of the West where this doesn't actually work really either. But certainly according to strict political science models, these decisions and processes are the product of hierarchical decisions, whether by an authoritarian state or a democratic state, whether by an elected parliament or a, a, a ruler, which then pass down through regular institutions until they are eventually implemented in society. And my argument in the book is that, on the whole, Pakistan doesn't work like this at all. 
that most decisions, most processes, the implementations of laws have to be negotiated between different sources of power within society. Um, and that this is a fundamental manifestation uh, of the weakness of the Pakistani state, that, that most of the time, whether under military or civilian government, the Pakistani state is simply not strong enough to implement most of its own decisions without having to make endless negotiated compromises with sections of society. Um, as I say, that title um, was a bit too academic for Penguin, although it still expresses a large part of the argument. We ended up with a title which in part reflects one aspect, a uh, frequent aspect of negotiation within Pakistan, which is violence. But pretty often, um, not just today, of course, um, in terms of the battles with the militants, uh, but in terms of the ordinary workings of Pakistani politics, whether ethnic politics in Karachi, uh, or pretty often actually um, just rural politics between different clans and tribes in certain parts of the country. If not violence, then the possibility, the latent possibility of violence is there as part of the negotiating process. But not all out absolute violence, but tactical violence and operating according to certain rules and forms. Um, and the title we came up with in the end was indeed Pakistan a hard country. Um, and Penguin chose that uh, partly um, because um, it suggests hard dilemmas for Western strategy. Uh, it suggests um, that uh, it is in many ways a resilient country, hard in the sense of tough. This is another fundamental argument of my book, uh, that the argument about Pakistan as a, as a failed or failing state misses these profound sources of resilience in Pakistani society, which I'll come to in my remarks. So it's a tough, a resilient state. Um, but finally, of course, it does reflect a certain hardness in aspects of Pakistani life. And the phrase, a hard country or a difficult country, is one that I've often heard from Pakistanis themselves. Uh, very often in the context of the first time I heard it and the last time I heard this phrase, a hard country or a difficult country used. Um, the first time was when I was out in Pakistan, when I went out to Pakistan as a, a journalist in the late 1980s. And the phrase was used by a landowning politician in southern Punjab to explain why he'd had to have five people killed the previous year um, as part of a, a feud with his neighbors. Um, and uh, he explained that they'd attacked him first. He said, in this country, if you don't show that you hit back hard if attacked, he said, you're finished. Every one of my neighbors has a claim against my land or my water. Uh, if my followers lost confidence in my ability to defend myself and therefore defend them, they'd abandon me you know, and go over to my rivals. Uh, he said, you know, that may shock you, he said, but you have to understand this is a hard country. <laughs> Last time I heard it was from a, a superintendent of police, likewise in, in um, Punjab, to explain why, given the hopelessness of the Pakistani judicial system, and he admitted candidly that that was also because of the um, inability of the police to bring solid uh, prosecutions with evidence that would stand up to serious judicial scrutiny. Um, if the police, and he also candidly admitted on the intermittent occasions when they felt absolutely compelled to do something about sectarian terrorism by Lashkari Jangvi, uh, the only way to, to send a message to these people to back off um, was to take three of them or so. And he, he said or claimed that they tried to take the nastier ones, the ones who you know, good evidence that they had been involved in murders, um, take them out into a field in the middle of the night and shoot them in the back of the head. What's called in South Asia encounter killings. We would call it extrajudicial executions. By the way, extremely common, uh, indeed probably just as common by the Indian police as by the Pakistani police. This is not a specifically Pakistani thing. Um, so he said, this, this, you know, given if we bring them before the courts, they're acquitted. Um, whether because the courts are intimidated or whether they sympathize or simply because we're so incompetent. So we feel we have to do something about it. We shoot them in the back of the head. And once again, he said, you have to understand this is a hard country. So that's where the, the title eventually uh, came from. 
Uh, the, um, the fundamental thesis of the book uh, is this, that Pakistani political society has deep sources, as I've said, of resilience. Resilience in the face of, well, the biggest threat now uh, being Islamist revolution, but actually an overthrow of the state by an Islamist revolt, but also resilience in the face simply of disintegration, of collapse as a result of a range of local problems and rebellions. And ultimately, I attribute this resilience to three sources. The first, paradoxically, but th this entire book, I, I hope as a reflection of uh, Pak Pakistani reality, the book is full of paradoxes. Um, Pakistani society is rather full of such paradoxes. I was saying um, this morning at the foreign ministry that uh, in the original manuscript of the book, I used the phrase Janus faced about Pakistan. In other words, you know, things that are both good and bad. So often that my editor uh, went through the manuscript and made 18 deletions. And there are still five or six there. Thus, for example, I attribute part of the resilience of Pakistan uh, to its very vicipariousness, um, to the, the lack of a unifying national identity or culture. Now, this is Janus faced because, on the one hand, uh, it has made impossible the dream held by two military rulers and one civilian ruler, namely Ayub, Musharraf, and Bhutto, uh, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, of doing an Ataturk in Pakistan, of modernizing Pakistan as a, as a modern Muslim national state um, by reforms from above. Well, of course, the difference, the key difference there is uh, that Ataturk could rely on Turkish nationalism, Turkish ethnic nationalism. Now, it must be said that had in many ways hideous results for Turkish society. We now have a, we've created for ourselves a nice myth about Turkey's progress and democratic reform. We've forgotten that the modern Turkish state was, of course, originally founded on a hecatomb of corpses. Um, uh, of ethnic, ethnic and religious minorities, and of various forms of savage repression, even of Turkish religious minorities, of a kind which is simply out of the question for the Pakistani state. But above all, of course, uh, Pakistan can't have an ethnic nationalism because it isn't an ethnic nation. Um, Pakistan is a constructed nation put together out of different nationalities and ethnicities. That in itself doesn't make Pakistan the kind of wild anomaly that many people think, because actually that's true of most former colonies in the world. Um, some of them successful, some of them unsuccessful. But the fact that Pakistan was, you know, a, a, if you like, a, a construct rather than a natural um, country, uh, in itself is not worth the oceans of academic, you know, criticism and speculation. M much of this you know, is still, frankly, the hangover of 1947, not worth bothering about. But certainly, it does make it very difficult to launch some national modernizing project, because you can't generate the mass nationalist support for that kind of project. And you need that mass nationalist support if you're going to smash down the entrenched opposition of so many local forces, local elites, local traditions. That is an integral, doing that is an integral part of modernization from above in many countries around the world. In, in fact, in virtually all countries around the world, it can't be done in Pakistan in that way. On the other hand, this immense diversity of Pakistani society, um, reflected in the religious field, there are Diff so many different kinds of Islam, uh, reflected obviously in the ethno-linguistic field, in the cultural field, make it, in my view, impossible to think of a unified Islamist revolution sweeping to power in Pakistan. Uh, because the, the, the parties which espouse such a, a revolution, this could change in future, but up to now have only represented 
one relatively narrow religious tradition in the country, a religious tradition in turn only really supported in certain areas of the country. Now, that is changing to a degree, but in my view, not nearly fast enough um, to produce the possibility of a united revolution. So this very plurality and diversity is a force on the one hand uh, against modernization and for if you like, the stagnation of society, uh, but it is also a force for um, opposition uh, to radical revolution. The second force against this is the immense entrenched power in most of the country still uh, of the Pakistani elites, um, the political elites. Uh, a, a power w with different roots, um, but it, for me, the, the, the most important are obviously wealth. You have to have wealth. But secondly, kinship, very often, especially in the countryside, but quite often, at least outside Karachi, to a surprising extent in many of the towns as well still. Now, one of the problems in Pakistan when it comes to making suggestions like this is that the lack of empirical work on the ground, tremendous lack of PhDs, you know, really studying different areas of the country and different features of the country in detail, mean that very often uh, one is operating on the basis of what might be called educated guesswork. And I'm well aware that in my book, one of the criticisms, and a legitimate criticism, is that I haven't paid enough ten attention uh, to the consequences of urbanization. Now, I do talk about this in the book, but what I say candidly in the book is I'm not sure. The reason I'm not sure is that we, we don't have the empirical evidence for just what the effects of this are. I have a student who's going out to study this in Punjab. Um, what I would say is that it seems that they have been less than one would have expected. There was a, a book, a study by Andrew Wilder, which came out in the mid-90s, so already it was 15 years ago now. Um, now, if he were, it, it's called, by the way, something like electoral politics in Pakistan. But of course, one of the things one must always beware of, and I know very well that I've erred myself on this, is that so often, when, whether the writer himself or because of the publisher, books come out or statements are made such and such in Pakistan. And then it turns out, well, Wilder was essentially studying cities in Punjab, not Pakistan as a whole. But if Andrew's conclusions had been entirely correct, then 15 years later, one would have expected the effects of urban, urbanization on transforming politics to have gone much further than they actually seem to. And the continued importance of kinship uh, in some of the cities, uh, I think, is a reflection of that. Money and kinship put together uh, help to produce, though they don't by any means altogether govern, uh, the third central feature of Pakistani politics, which is patronage. That is to say, the extraction of resources from the state and the distribution of them to the followers of politicians. Um, this, in turn, uh, is responsible, in my view, or plays an important role in maintaining the resilience of the present Pakistani political order. It's also responsible for, though only partly responsible, for another striking feature of Pakistan, which is uh, Pakistan is seen as a, a deeply unequal society. Curiously enough, by international standards, this is not true, relatively speaking. Striking thing that I came across in the course of my research is, is that the Gini coefficient uh, by the way, if anyone asks me to explain the Gini coefficient, um, my response is that I, I was raised as a Catholic. It's like the Holy Trinity. You have to take it on faith. <laughs> I'm told that the Gini coefficient is a very good and accurate way of measuring social inequality. And I believe it. <laughs> but don't ask me to explain it. Um, but anyway, Pakistan's Gini coefficient is remarkably low. The reasons for this are twofold, it seems to me. One is, obviously, 
Unfortunately, Pakistan produces neither the raw materials for export, oil, gas, whatever, that in other societies, other countries produce enormous fortunes, differentiate from them from the masses, nor, of course, unfortunately, does it have the manufacturing base, which in other countries can provide that kind of gross discrepancy. Instead, and by the way, I mean, this is part of a tradition in, in South Asia, which long predates the, um, the British, let alone uh, Pakistani state. Um, fortunes are made to a very considerable extent through state service. Um, <laughs> You get into the state, and then whether by the fo in the old days, by the formal decision, whether of the British governor uh, or the Mughal emperor or the local king or whatever, you are rewarded with state resources. Now, of course, that isn't formally done, but by God, it's informally done. Uh, you get into politics, you serve either a military or a civilian government, and you are effectively allowed to take state resources. But why does the state need you? Why does the government need you? The reason is the government is not powerful enough to control society itself. It needs local figures to run society for it. Um, but to be worth rewarding, those local figures have to have support. Otherwise, they're not worth rewarding. In order to maintain that support, they have to distribute a reasonable proportion, an honorable proportion of what they extract from the state to their followers, or their followers wouldn't follow them anymore. That applies as much as anybody else, usually, to their own kinship groups. On the one hand, very often, they need a kinship group as the basis, the original basis of their political faction and following. On the other hand, in almost every kinship group, there is a potential uncle, cousin, even brother, uh, who will step forward to seize the leadership if the existing political representative does not share out the benefits of office fairly to his followers. And I heard that again and again in, in Pakistan. Somebody would say, why did you vote for so-and-so? Well, I voted it for him because he's of my biradari, his, my clan, my, my kinship group. And you ask them, so that so will you always vote for him for that reason? Oh, no, he has to do something for me. He doesn't do something for me. Well, there are other representatives of that group I can vote for. So, and that is, once again, a very old pattern in that part of the world. From that point of view, I am, um, but once again, I don't wish anything I say to be taken as categorical, even if it sounds categorical. Uh, there's been some very interesting um, work by Matthew Nelson, and others on political change in Punjab. And Matthew would suggest that um, patronage, uh, that the, the, the local elites in the countryside are distributing less of the patronage now, that this old si system that I've described is in fact breaking down. I wonder about that, in part because the term feudal, as applied to these elites, is in many ways mistaken. Um, it's mistaken because this isn't feudal in anything like the classical European sense. It's also feudal, uh, not feudal. Um, and incidentally, perhaps European feudalism was also not feudal in this sense, if you like. In that, uh, the existing order is pretty flexible when it comes to allowing new actors to come up. Uh, if you travel around, now this differs greatly from area to area. Northern Punjab is very different from southern Punjab in this regard, which is different again from interior Sindh. Kinship works in very different ways in Baluchistan from the way it does in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and so forth and so on. Um, but Certainly, in large parts of Punjab, if you travel around in the districts, you find that a very large part of the local political elites is not, in fact, composed of old feudal families. It's composed of new families who've come up in recent decades or more recently. Now, admittedly, by the way, it's an old pattern in England, at least, uh, they very often intermarried with the older families. 
But much more importantly, they are, as far as I can see, behaving in very much the same ways politically when it comes especially to the, use, the uses of kinship and the distribution of patronage. And therefore, I wonder to a degree whether the phenomenon that Matthew has observed um, is necessarily more than, once again, a very old pattern, uh, which is that a family has established itself. It's got a good deal of wealth. And if not the children, then the grandchildren or the great-grandchildren very understandably prefer to enjoy that wealth and position rather than having to engage in what was always the rather grim, rather boring, rather hot, or sometimes even cold in winter, uh, tedious work of politics. Politics. I mean, today, electoral politics, but politics always about cultivating your local base, rewarding your followers, sorting out local disputes. And so if you read the British Gazetteers, again and again, you will have a description of some great local family whose influence is declining because the sons prefer to spend their time in Lahore with dancing girls and so forth, rather than maintaining their authority, their prestige in the district by doing all this grim work of politics. But does this mean, therefore, that a, a, a new, completely different system is arising in these districts? No, not at all. There are just new families coming up, poorer families, but whose sons do do the grim work of day-to-day -day politics, do get up at 3 o'clock in the morning to go to the police station to get the nephew of one of their followers out of jail, and so forth and so on. Just a thought, but once again, we don't, you know, there isn't enough empirical work done really to be sure about this, just so we don't know about the effects of, of, um, uh, of urbanization in Punjab. But anyway, this is the, the second aspect of stability in Pakistan. The third reason uh, for the survival of Pakistan in the short to medium term is, of course, the army. Now, the power of the army in Pakistan uh, comes from two sources. Uh, well, it comes, the perception, I mean, the, the relative uh, internal honesty and efficiency of the army, internal, which in turn in the past has periodically given large numbers of Pakistanis the idea that the, because the army works comparatively or relatively well internally, it can therefore take over the whole state and make it work better. Um, maybe this illusion has now gone for good, we'll have to see, but certainly it's recurred repeatedly in the past. This relative internal efficiency and honesty of the army comes from two sources. Uh, and, but ultimately, it comes from the fact that it has extracted itself from the normal workings of patronage, kinship, faction, corruption, partly for personal gain and partly for patronage, uh, which um, govern Pakistani politics and increasingly have governed the civil service as well. Where does this come from? A, it comes from the fact that the Pakistani military has, as I say in the book, has extracted itself from kinship group politics, in part by turning itself into a giant kinship group. I, I, I say in the book that the Pakistani army likes to regard itself as a big family, uh, and in many ways it acts just like a Pakistani big family. <laughs> the difference is that most uh, big families in Pakistan, however big they may be, um, have limited opportunities to extract resources from the state. The Pakistani military has had virtually unlimited abilities <laughs> to raise resources from the state. In other words, you've taken a very large chunk of whatever resource, you know, revenues the Pakistani state has been able to raise, um, which, by the way, are not many. Pakistan has the lowest rates of um, tax collection in South Asia. Uh, but the army has taken a large proportion of these and distributed it to itself. Now, of course, that in certain circumstances, 
obviously helps you to be honest. And I talk in the book about, it's a cliche, but it's also entirely true. Um, you have two people who are heading for retirement. One is, say, a civil servant uh, or a superintendent of police, um, and the other is a colonel in the army. The colonel in the army, even better, a general, uh, when he retires, um, will have a plot of land or two plots of land, depending on his service, uh, one of whom he can live on. And build, he's had an opportunity to build a house there, you know, pay, paying it off in generous installments, or not, not, I mean, easy installments to the military. The other he can sell, and these military plots of land are now in some of the most valuable real estate in Pakistan. So, you know, he makes, makes a, a very decent fortune out of that. Um, and secondly, very often, um, the military will either give him a job in a military industry, uh, or will help him uh, to find a job in some aspect of the civil sector, whether in the government or you know, military people, as in the West, by the way, are, are much favored by uh, certain NGOs and, and um, business and so forth for their skills. Uh, and so he's a happy man. Uh, he can look after his pension, he can pay for his children's education, and he can play a lot of golf. He doesn't need to be corrupt. Superintendent of police or civil servant in a very different position. Exiguous pension, no plot of land, and not necessarily, at least, any retirement job waiting for him. Therefore, he damn well has to steal money. And to get cover for stealing money, he also most probably has to protect himself with some political faction or protector or whatever, which in turn tends to render the entire, it, it, it in a way privatizes large, large areas of the state. So that's the first aspect of relative military efficiency and honesty internally. This says nothing about when the military goes out to rule the state, you understand, but it's the, the image of the military as internally an honest and efficient institution. However, it's not only that. The other aspect of this, or the other reason for this, uh, is the uh, military ethos. In other words, in other countries, the military would, would take all this money from the state and the generals would steal it all. That doesn't happen in Pakistan. Or if it does happen, it happens in a regulated, hierarchical way in which, yes, obviously the generals get more, but the benefits are passed down uh, through the system, even to some degree to the ordinary soldiers. Um, in terms of benefits for them, for their families, and help with jobs when they retire, if they retire with a, a clean slate. Uh, this, by the way, should not necessarily be criticized as much uh, as it is sometimes, because um, keeping the military happy is rather important in present circumstances. I always remember, remember the, the advice of the Emperor Caracalla to his son on his deathbed? Son asked him, what's the most... Daddy, what's the, what's the most important advice you can, you can give me? Caracalla said, remember to pay the soldiers, and died. <laughs> so just keep that in mind. We're asking, you know, the soldiers being asked to do at the moment a lot of things they really don't like, you know, as part of the, the war against militancy. It's probably a good idea to pay them well. Why does the army operate like this? And you know, not become a, simply a completely corrupt institution. Well, here one gets into the business of their internal ethos. And that might be summed up, and here one really gets into the Janus-faced business, uh, by saying that the Pakistani is the only institution in the Pakistani state which really still embodies, to a genuine extent, Pakistani nationalism. That is to say, Pakistan nationalism of Pakistan as a country, as opposed to, yes, a you know, certain degree of Pakistani nationalism, but elsewhere qualified immensely, either by local ethnic loyalties or by kinship loyalties or everything else. Um, and that is instilled in the Pakistani soldier from the day he, or some, sometimes occasionally, at least in the Air Force, she joins. Um, that you are loyal to Pakistan, and of course, Pakistan's survival depends on the military. Therefore, you're loyal to Pakistan, but Pakistan should also damn well be loyal to you. Um, and the Pakistani military often reminds me of, uh, I think it's apocryphal, but certainly true to life, of a, um, 
a British general um, who wrote to his son in the 18th century. We've bled for our country, and be damned if our country shall not bleed for us. Moderately. <laughs> um, now, the problem about this nationalism is, of course, that in Pakistan as a whole, but above all in the military, this nationalism is like so many, or possibly even most nationalisms, in their formative stages and beyond. Uh, it depends very, very heavily on a perception of outside threat, on the mobilization of hostility to outside enemies, or really, in the case of Pakistan, to one outside enemy, which is India. Um, this, in turn, of course, and I'm not saying by any manner of means that uh, India is necessarily guiltless in you know, everything that has happened over the years, but certainly, the, um, the, the way in which the attitudes of the Pakistani military in particular have really revolved around this hostility to and fear of India uh, have had, of course, very, very negative consequences uh, for the country as a whole. Um, so on the one hand, this, this really strong and passionate nationalism you know, prevents the army from becoming, if you like, a Nigerian or West African army. <laughs> On the other hand, it turns the army and, to a certain extent, the entire state in the direction of a rivalry with India, which even if Pakistan is by no means uh, ho wholly to blame for this, not at all, uh, nonetheless has, of course, embroiled Pakistan both in a geopolitical rivalry which risk ba risks bankrupting the country. And you will find now Pakistani generals themselves who will admit the possible parallel with the Soviet Union you know, in the sense of get, getting involved in a, a long-term rivalry with a much, much bigger, richer state that you essentially can't win. Um, and, of course, it, it has led the Pakistani military to a number of um, foreign policy and security policy actions which have come back disastrously to bite Pakistan. Above all, of course, in t um, from the, the sponsorship of militancy and terrorism against India in the past, which has now landed, which landed Pakistan with what are, in effect, Frankenstein's monsters within, in terms of militant groups, some of which have now gone into rebellion against the Pakistani state, others of which have not, I'm thinking above all of Lashkari Taiba, uh, but the fear that they might is, of course, heavily influencing the Pakistani military in its um, inability, essentially, to do anything about these groups. Uh, fear of India has also um, heavily uh, influenced Pakistani strategy uh, in Afghanistan uh, in ways uh, which have also had very negative effects. Uh, however, I think I've now talked for enough. Um, and I said that you know I wouldn't get into issues of Afghan strategy. And so we, if any, anyone's interested, we can talk about that in the discussion. So anyway, um, I think I will end there. That is my, I mean, the, the book has, of course, uh, lots of other bits. Um, there's a chapter devoted to the, the different religious traditions, a chapter uh, devoted to competing judicial orders in, in Pakistan, um, and uh, a ho uh, whole section devoted to the different provinces of Pakistan and the balance between them. And then the last section of the book, but only the last section, is devoted to the Pashtun areas and the, um, and the revolt of the Pakistani Taliban in recent years. And the book begins with a chapter which uh, attempts to situate Pakistan in the history of Islam in South Asia, uh, going back um, over the centuries. So um, a description of the book. Thank you all so much. Thank you very much, Anand. I think uh, yeah, you did a great job in taking us into this journey to, uh, I would say, that the, the main components, as you said, of Pakistan's resilience. I, I think it was very clear and very well articulated. And um, then I also remember why I didn't want to share this uh, session. It's because uh, in the meantime, I had prepared like something like six, six pages of uh, comments, and, uh, <laughs> and now I, um, you know, I'm just stuck here. I can't uh, possibly share them, so I'll... Uh, but oh, we're having dinner together. Oh, we're yeah, having dinner together, so I will uh, take them out tonight. But uh, no, that gives me the opportunity indeed to uh, give the word to our two discussants, so uh, I'll uh, go first with uh, Hans Singer, if you like. Thank you. Um, 
First of all, uh, thank you to Prio and Nora for uh, being uh, gener generous enough to invite me to this. Um, I feel uh, woefully underqualified in this presence. Um, it's a little bit of a humbling experience, but I'm going to do my best. Um, first of all, uh, as was mentioned, uh, this is a rather large book, but in a good sense. <laughs> uh, there is a lot to discuss. and. So apologies if this might seem a little bit piecemeal, but I've tried to pinpoint some certain key, key things about the book that I find interesting. Um, two things that I really like, and then there's one thing I have a little bit of an issue with. Um, I'm saving that for last. Um, let me start with what I think is the best part of the book, the strongest part. And you, coming from a political science perspective, uh, how do you analyze Pakistan? It's, you know, neorealism is obviously pretty much useless in this context. It's, you have to go down a, a level at least further down to understand why uh, Pakistan act, acts the way it does, especially in the region. Um, you know, issues of sort of rationality become fairly meaningless when you're dealing with the sort of an intricate uh, state and societal structure as this. And I, I, I found it very helpful uh, reading uh, Levin's book, uh, how he sort of, he, he does two things with the book. First of all, it's a counterweight to uh, a lot of the uh, policy debate, especially in the US on Pakistan, which has become uh, fairly caricatured, or it has a caricatured image of Pakistan. And Levin does a, an admirable job uh, being a counterweight to this, giving uh, a, a lot of nuance where there hasn't been that much. The second part, uh, from an academic perspective, is that he, you know, he comes up with you know, sort of a theoretical framework for understanding Pakistan as, as an actor, but also as a society. On this uh, topic, what I he mentioned something, but I just wanted to sort of challenge you. I would really like to hear more about uh, uh, the ecological disaster that you mentioned. Yep. Uh, and another very important question uh, that sort of came to mind when I was reading this is that, you know, if Pakistan, if the entire society is you know, a patronage society, what happens when the economy crashes? What happens when you have capital flight? What happens when you know you can no longer afford to pay your soldiers or your clan? Or you know, what happens when there's not enough money to go around? You know, maybe yeah. not disintegration, but what what are the sort of potential uh, challenges to look for? The um, other major part of the book that I liked was um, you talk a lot about anti-Americanism. So when you say that this book is not about Western policy, I, I, I do want to amend that a little bit because yeah, it is a recurring enough. theme in the book mm -hmm. that uh, I don't want to describe it as reactive, but you, a, a lot of the Pakistani sentiments and policies and behavior in the region, uh, you, know, you, you paint this picture of them being, a lot of it at least, being a reaction to US policy. And you, and I think that is um, um, not to say that you know, the, the Pakistani people and Pakistan are passive or rea merely reactive, but it's a very interesting point. And it's a very important point that has escaped uh, a lot of the uh, discussion on US policy in Afghanistan, but particularly Pakistan, in that you have a quant quantitative studies showing you know, sort of be beneficial effects of drone strikes in the tribal areas where you've seen you, know, you have seen correlation between terrorism uh, and drone strikes but there has been the issue of the strategic costs of the US policy has been neglected for far too long and Levin does a very good job here at uh, illustrating how this affects uh, the three pillars of Pakistan, you know, he, how anti-Americanism is on the rise in the population itself, 
but also it, how it weakens the civilian government. And perhaps even more surprising, but also most troublesome, is how this can weaken the military. Mm. That the military is seen as a puppet or a tool of the Americans. And I, w I would say that's not true, but if that is the perception within the, pop within the public, then perception becomes reality to an extent. So I, I, I really appreciated you spending a lot of time on that. Okay. As for the uh, one thing I, I had some issue with, um, <laughs> I've been thinking about how to frame this in a constructive or nice way. Uh, um, I do think you are overly generous w when you're describing the military. Um, as I mentioned earlier about describing, you know, describing responses to uh, to U.S. policy, they do. S there is a the military is to a certain extent described as reactive, uh, and you do a very good job describing the restraints on the context of the military, which are very useful in understanding what a, you know what maneuvering room they do have, but. Um, there are two parts, especially when you talk about the military, that, that I had some issue with. Uh, the first one is when you're discussing the uh, the economic nature of the military and how you know they've built up this giant fund. Um, I w was hoping for a more of a critical assessment there, uh, because there, you know there are two main issues with you know the military uh, accruing wealth is that you have the potential for capital flight, which you describe. Uh, in certain parts, uh, which can have de detrimental effects on the uh, domestic economy. Uh, the second is that, you know, by building up its own wealth, it is you know becoming a state within a state if it's not already, and you know then you get into very serious issues here about civil military uh, relations and civilian control. You know, not that. The civilians have control. You know, I'm, speak <laughs> I'm speaking, you know, in normative terms here. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but th th there is, uh, you know, I, I wish you'd been a little bit more critical there. Uh, but you know, it, of course, you know, it is important to keep in mind that, you know, there is a, a trade there. There is, you know, as you said, it is a negotiated state, and I, I, I I'm going to steal that uh, description uh, uh, for later. Um, but, but the overarching the longer question here is, um, you know, how far are you willing to go to support the military, you know, or how far is the the, the state willing to support the military? You know, it, it, it is you know, it is a rather dangerous road to go down um, because I don't think it it is, it is sustainable uh, to have such a large uh, military and such a sort of you know, independent military. But now we're going into normative issues that are you know. Yeah. Um, the s second point. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I, th I think I. Front All right. <laughs> okay. The um, second part on the mil the second po point on the military um, is on. I even wrote down the page number here. Uh, on page four hundred and twelve, you write that Pakistan has not given much support to the Taliban since nine eleven. They've given shelter, but not much support. And you, s for as of evidence of that, you cite that uh, the Afghan Taliban has not very sophisticated weaponry and has not had very sophisticated training. Uh, to me, that I don't think that is sufficient evidence for 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 claim that goes runs counter to what a lot of others have written before. Uh, and I do, you know, I, 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 I like that you you reference the LSE report by uh, Waldman. Waldman, yes, uh, who who makes the exact opposite claim. But of course, he that I ha there are some big issues with that report as well, as you point out. But um, I do feel that you needed more evidence to back up that claim, and on that. And in that context, what I would have uh, liked more to have seen, I, and maybe you can comment on this, is the role of the Akani network. Uh, I think, 
I counted in your index, you have two, two references to the Akani network. And if, I don't know if people have seen this, but you know, last year the uh, Counterterrorism Center at West Point came up with a very uh, good extensive report on the Akani network and its relationship with Al-Qaeda. And which basically rewrites a lot of the history we've had on the militancy in the region. And so if you could talk a little bit more about that. Um, see, you. But, you know, if, if we're looking at sort of the policy perspective here, and I think this is, you know, your book is very helpful in setting up this framework for understanding Pakistan, because you know, my, my, my hypothesis, my thinking on, on the regional issues right now is that you know, the U.S. And the, and the Pakistani state, or Pakistan as an actor, they have uh, at times you know, directly conflicting interests. And this has been um, ignored too much in, in the policy debate because um, there you, you have several dim dimensions or levels here. You have the time frame issue, uh, but then you also have the various parts of the actor or parts of the state. And whereas the the U.S. you know the, you know, the U.S. has you know, an interest in stability and whatnot in the region, uh, what, whereas the Obama administration has a political incentive, has a political interest in just getting it as stable as possible before 2014 and then getting out in Afghanistan. I'm, I mean, whereas Pakistan has a much longer term uh, interest, but there are also in within Pakistan there are opposing interests. I would say, you know, at least from, you know, if you look at it from a sort of conceptual level, you know, the, the army has an interest in maintaining um, its standing in society, which it can do by, you know, continuing uh, you know, a, a belligerent tone against India. It can it can continue that by, you know, you know, being involved in Afghanistan, sort of creating uh, creating facts on the ground, whereas you know the civilian. Side, the civilian government is more interested in stability and does not necessarily want, you know, the the, the blowback that comes from uh, supporting uh, jihadi groups abroad. Um, I think I'm out of time now, but um, all right, I think I've given you enough things to comment now. Sure. Do, before, yeah, can I just uh, give the word also of to course. the others and maybe there the might things that can come back. So if Arne wants also to uh, give his thoughts on, I don't know if it, it does it work. Well, I can try. Can you hear me? Um, first, uh, this is probably the best book and most comprehensive book I've read on Pakistan. Big congratulations, both on covering so thoroughly the different provinces and then going into some of the issues I think is extremely important in the discussion about Pakistan today. I actually like the title a negotiated state much better than, uh, <laughs> I, than I the hard country. <laughs> because that is exactly to me how Pakistan was and functioned when the time I've been working there because everything was somehow, even, even if you thought something was decided, yeah. it emerged again as something that you could negotiate a bit further on. So a constantly negotiated state might be even a better term to be used on Pakistan and I'll come back on that. Um, what I think is also important, what you've done here, is you have taken up some of what I, I call as myths being developed on Afghanistan. One is that it is a fragile state. Date, I think you have shown, but I will come back to that. It's not fragile as it stands today, but there are elements coming up that might make it more fragile. And this whole fear of an Islamist takeover, which I think is highly exaggerated, and you show it through statistics, you show it through uh, the strengths of the different Islamist groups to show that they have really had less influence. And I think if you add on to that elections and to see what parties then gain support through the election process, they actually, they are good in arguing before the election, but they usually have a large fallout when it comes to the election, which really shows the strength of it. And I think you also very, very correctly point out the whole dilemma that my colleague also points out is between the West and Pakistan now and where Pakistan is then heading. And I'll come back a bit back to that when it comes to the relationship with China as well, because there is this game being played out where Ch Pakistan positions themselves in this game. But then rather than to um, 
to go into a discussion on the book, I rather pick. I picked five themes that I like to say a bit more on. Some of them, which I think you haven't covered sufficiently in the book. Others that I think I can pick up on and and say a bit more about. Um, different when it comes to energy. It goes both for electricity. Large part of the country is at presently under more or less. Would you call it load shedding? There is no electricity after a certain time. But then comes that the gas resources in Baluchistan is also running out. Pakistan is desperately in need of that both electricity and gas to be able, both for the common population, to have a life where the electricity actually can be switched on and off, and for the not least for the industry to have gas and to have electricity to further develop both the small industry but not least larger industries. And this, this is, a, it's a, to me, a very important point because it really is a constant reminder of all the population when electricity disappears during, at 8 o'clock during the night. It's a, it's, a, this, uh, it's a constant reminder of the failure of the government to actually to provide for the citizens. And to me, that's a source where then, if in a, the economic development also fails, it's a source for mobilization. It's where you can really show that the government is not functioning. The second area which you have very much gone into the whole discussion about the situation of the Pashtuns, which I call them. Uh, but I think you the could Pashtuns, have... Pashtuns, as the British Army <laughs> actually calls them. I know, that's why I'm calling <laughs> the Pashtuns. But the whole area of, of the, the tribal areas, not only the province where most of them are living, but the situation in the tribal area is to me of concern. I think there has been too much emphasis on the military side of it and the whole idea of defeating military insurgents without looking at two other crucial elements. One is the complete lack of development in these areas, which has been neglected for a long period of time, which is then also easily used for mobilization. But the second thing is then that we should also remind ourselves that these areas were granted a special status within Pakistan, which the Pakistani army violated yeah. under pressure from the Americans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when I was in Jalalabad last, from weeks ago, I was also reminded about the sound of the drones, mm -hmm. which the people call the shaitans, because it's, it's a constant fear, and it's a constant reminder of violation of tribal, uh, tribal area and Pashtun uh, independence. And all these together somehow shows that there is a need to put further emphasis on that. But you could then start by actually discussing what kind of possibility is it for tribal area to become an, not the tribal area but a part of Pakistan and that the citizens of tribal area should have more of a role in actually being part of the political setup of Pakistan. Uh, we visited the, um, the, uh, the provincial assembly in Peshawar last year and they had made a lot of new seats where they said they would welcome their brothers from the tribal area. I'm not sure if they like to be part of the setup of uh, that province, but something is needed on the political influence. Uh, the third, then, which you also go into, is the concern over land ownership. Uh, we can go into a discussion of feudalism or landowners and all, all that. My concern is that there, are, there hasn't been any land reform in Pakistan. There are large areas where that is presently ruled by a few large landowners then oft linked up to the political establishment and what you can call the feudal elite. That's a fact. But then something happened in SWAT, an uprising in SWAT that caught my attention. Because the militants, to me, didn't seem to have much of a support in the very beginning, before they brought land issues on the table. Before they started to talk about that the land of the powerful should be distributed. That was what, what I see as a time when they really started to mobilize and gain support for their cause. And that means that it, it wasn't somehow the Islamist movement that had people join in. It was more a hope for a redistribution of land and that the poorer segments could take part of that. Of course, the rebellion in SWAT was crushed, but if this idea, combined with some more mad mullahs, is taken on in Punjab, I think it could have completely different political implications. And the question then, combined with other concerns over the environment, concerns about the lack of, of access to land, the, and again the criticism of the state, could this be a rallying point for people to come together on a different platform, but possibly be used for to rally against the state? I think that there need to be some serious 
again, more research is needed on the whole issue of land ownership as well. Let me then take um, a bit look on, on the region as well, and my colleague has already spoken a bit about Afghanistan, and I don't think, I think we should reserve most of the time on Pakistan, so we <laughs> shouldn't go into that big debate on who supports whom. But I, I understand why Pakistan is concerned at the moment. Uh, and I think it was articulated by someone, two, two, two phrases. One said that we fear very much that a Tajik-dominated Afghan government, influenced by India and supported by US troops, can actually attack Pakistan. I'm not sure that will happen, but that's a concern being built up. Then there was a concern in Pashtun areas that came to me through an old friend saying that, do you know what is the American plans? I said, no. Do you? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> they are going first to, to they are using uh, Amer Afghan soldiers. No, they will first go into the tribal areas and then they will come to Peshawar. And that's a fear in the population that somehow then makes it easy to mobilize against that well. And here, we are at the point where somehow this whole lack of dialogue, proper dialogue at all levels between Pakistan and Afghanistan is becoming a threat. <coughs> the Afghans are using any kind of accusation against Pakistan as an excuse for not discussing internal matters. Mm -hmm. Because they have a scapegoat they can turn to for whatever failure there is in Afghanistan. But Pakistan, I don't really, they believe, have quite understood how important it is for them to be seen as someone contributing positively to a settlement in Afghanistan. Things they had uh, influence on the Taliban, on negotiation positions, arrest of Taliban leaders, all of that, add into an increasing concern among the Afghans, if you can trust on the Pakistanis, which then, in the end, might turn different groups against them. So that's a reminder. This, this is where more dialogue is needed between all, all groups. But then to the last, and the whole issue of the relationship with uh, Pakistan's relationship with the uh, US as well. I think we have seen over the last years that the old friendship with China, which has been strong and helped build the Karakoram Highway and done a tremendous good for Pakistan, is at the critical point at the moment. Because I've seen different signals on Pakistan putting more and more emphasis on China somehow replacing Pakistan as a donor, also as a security guarantee. And that the bad relationship with India is taught to be able to be balanced with a better relationship with China. I am afraid that that won't work. I think we have seen the very first signals of that, of a Chinese company backing out of the funding of the gas pipeline to, to Iran because of fear of sanctions. I think it was rather clear with the latest, um, call it peace talks or trade talks that was between the Pakistani and Indian Prime Minister recently, where to me the Pakistani Prime Minister was very clear that he was more or less being instructed by China saying that regional trade is far more important to China than just the relationship with, with Pakistan. So with all the enemy resources that we now find in Afghanistan and Central Asia, which actually could then both help out Pakistan's need for electricity and gas and the whole region's access to the mineral resources, it could be also be a win-win situation for the whole region if this was resolved. And I think China is wise here to, to put pressure on Pakistan, and Pakistan is wise to listen to how they actually can then become the hub of energy transfer in the region, rather than what at the moment being seen as the one blocking it. Then to go back to the title of the book, and, and, and my main concern is that, I, I think you accurately described the situation in Pakistan in the sense that it, there is a constant negotiation and struggle between the bureaucracy, between the military, and between the politicians over who is to control the state. And my concern is that they get so preoccupied with that constantly negotiation that that becomes the soft spot of the otherwise hard country. Mm -hmm. That they are not paying enough attention to what is happening and the opportunities being laid out rather than to defend their own positions and turf. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, guess you've had uh, enough input <laughs> to lunch. I use the discussion. Thank you, thank you both so much. Uh, re really very, very valuable um, comments and, and criticisms. I'll, I'll respond f fairly quickly because, you know, so much like to hear from everybody else as well. Perhaps first of all on the more internal side and then 
moving to relations with the US and international policy, because that would make a good entry into the discussion. Uh, yes, I mean, quite right. I should have said more about the issue of energy and electricity. Uh, it is indeed very interesting um, from the point of view of the negotiated state and how it works and how it doesn't work. And something I find absolutely fascinating on that score uh, is the issue of the Kalabakh Dam. Because if you're in Sindh, Khaiba Pakhtunkhwa, NWFP as it used to be, you hear again and again that the Kalabakh Dam is this arch example of Punjab and the Punjabi a uh, military, industrial, civil service establishment ramming through policies which disregard the interests of other provinces because, of course, the, the point is that water will be taken upstream and will not reach Sindh. Areas of Haiba um, Bakhtunkwa will be flooded. Now, the plans for the Kalabakh Dam were first drawn up uh, more than 60 years ago. Can anyone tell me the most striking feature of the Kalabag Dam? It doesn't exist. It's never been built. 60 years, three episodes of military dictatorship, <laughs> several civilian governments, but the military dictatorship you know, always portrayed as in turn reflecting the interests of the Punjabi establishment. And the most striking, and by the way, I mean, this, this dam would be of immense benefit to Punjab industry and um, to a degree Punjab as a whole. And it would, at least as far as those sectors are concerned, yes, to a considerable degree, um, greatly help the electricity situation. And yet the thing hasn't been built. Now this says something, I think, and the reason it hasn't been built, of course, is precisely opposition from the other provinces. And what this demonstrates is the fact that even under military rule, the Pakistani state cannot simply ram things through. It has to compromise. Now, the sad thing, of course, is that there are two ways that this dam could have been built. Um, the first would have been an efficient dictatorship, which would have simply built the thing. Now, if it was a sensible dictatorship, it would also have tried to compensate the other provinces in certain ways. But anyway, it would have been built, and that's it. The other way would have been an efficient democracy, in which, on the one hand, Punjab would have got its dam, but the other provinces would have been compensated. For example, Sindh would have got a much bigger slice of central funds to compensate for whatever loss of water resulted by greatly improving the efficiency of its water use. Because, in fact, I mean, by far the most, even given population growth, possibly even given climate change, though we don't know the effects of that, there is actually enough water in Pakistan to go round. The point is that the use of it is so horribly inefficient and so wasteful. So Sindh would have got money to improve its water infrastructure. Actually, neither of these things has been possible. So you've had compromise not leading to action, but compromise leading to inaction and stagnation. So the dam hasn't been built, Punjab doesn't get its electricity, Sindh doesn't get you know, money for improving its water. Everybody grumbles. But on the other hand, nobody has been driven to the point of absolute revolt, uh, which could have happened, well, certainly, if the dam had been built, Sindh's water had gone down and Sindh had not been compensated. Revolt is just what you would have got. So I think this fits in very well. But it is worth pointing out on that score that, well, this does qualify this view of the, you know, of, of the tremendous power of a military-led sort of military-industrial uh, combination or complex. If this was as powerful as some people have said, that dam would have been built, and it hasn't been. Uh, and in part, that's because you know, the military has a fairly large chunk of what is unfortunately overall a rather small manufacturing sector. Um, you know, the, it, most regrettably, the formal industrial sector in Pakistan remains small. The informal, small-scale economy uh, is pretty big, but that's not what the military is involved in. Um, which means that, you know, overall, even if the military is powerful there, it neither gives it domination over the economy as a whole, nor indeed does it give the military the kind of existential stake in the industrial economy which would really have pulled it towards this kind of action. And when the military is in power, it doesn't seek out, as its key allies, industrialists. 
uh, it seek out, seeks out the same old quote unquote feudal politicians you know, who, who run the thing. And that is quite frankly because the industrialists are not powerful enough to be worthwhile cultivating and allying with. Um, now I have to say, uh, I'm actually, I, I must honestly confess, uh, as I hope I, I indicated, I'm very worried by the anti-Indian almost hysteria of the military, their role in that regard. Um, and certainly I, I don't regard the uh, military interventions in ruling the state uh, as at all desirable, P partly because they don't work. Um, you know, uh, yes, I, I might, uh, you know, might conceivably favor a, a more authoritarian government which would really develop the country. But the fact is the military have proved that they don't. They end up you know, just running the thing in the same old way. One thing that actually I'm pretty relaxed about is the military role in industry and the economy. The reason I'm relaxed about that is twofold. One is that the industrialists I know are relaxed about that. If you go to Faisalabad and talk to the industrialists there or wherever, um, they don't worry about you know, terrible illegitimate competition from military industries. <laughs> On the contrary, they welcome the military involvement in industry because that gives them more of a lobby in government which otherwise they don't have. Far from complaining about the Fauci Foundation, the industrialists I know complain constantly, why don't they you know, use their power within the military to, to push through you know, more electricity generation and so forth and so on. So you know, there I, I, I must confess, since I regard the industrialists as an absolutely you know, vital, playing a vital role in, in whatever economic development happens in, in Pakistan, I, I must honestly confess that the more powerful industrialists I, I see in Pakistan, the better. And I don't really care if they wear, wear uniform or not. So yes, quite honestly, I mean, there, I, you're quite right. I, I, I don't, I, I'm not um, too worried about it. Um, land reform. Here, the picture is very, very mixed in different parts of the country. Uh, there have been two land reforms, two major land reforms, one under Ayub and one under Bhutto. Now, they didn't go nearly as far as the Indian land reform, but they did contribute, though as part of wider social change, to a situation where in northern and central Punjab, the landowning situation has changed very much indeed since 1947. The really great old feudal families with their immense estates have gone. To a very considerable extent, even the old families which are still powerful in politics derive their money from urban property, from urban rents. Uh, either their own property in the towns or the fact that very often they are now intermarrying with a new urban bourgeoisie along classic, well, English and then European patterns. You know, the old aristocracy <laughs> marries a new bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie gets prestige. The old aristocracy gets um, uh, money. Um, and this was happening in Britain as, a, as early as the, the 15th century. And in Britain, in, now of course, more recently, you don't get what you got in 15th century England, what you still get in Pakistan, is that they both then go off and engage in the same old feudal politics. But anyway. Uh, but yes, I, I don't, you see, there, and, and it is in these areas, it's, and it must be said very strongly that it's in northern and central Punjab that Pakistan will be broken as a state, if, if it is to be broken. Um, and that is uh, about, because obviously it, it's the, it has the biggest single chunk of the population, it's the economic, the industrial heartland apart from Karachi, but also critically, uh, it's because most, where most of the army is recruited the rank and file. And it's very striking that the, the army has been willing to shoot down very considerable numbers of people in other provinces. As soon as you've had serious disturbances in northern Punjab, the military has looked for a change of government, including if it's a military government, the, the military has begun to abandon its, its own dictator. And, and that is because it's what I call the, the Petrograd syndrome, which we, you could also call the Tehran syndrome. Uh, Petrograd in 1917, Tehran in 1978. Uh, a line of soldiers confronts a crowd. Uh, if it's Russian soldiers 
facing a Polish crowd or a Latvian crowd, even possibly a Ukrainian crowd, no problem. Somebody shouts out from the crowd in, in Polish, down he goes. Similarly, Iranian soldiers facing a Kurdish crowd very different matter. If out of the crowd, ideally it should be a grandmother. The woman steps and cries out, sons, why are you shooting your own people? Do you want to kill your own grandmother? And this has been, you know, shown in a number of films. It's, it's cliche, but it's absolutely true. The, the rifle barrels <laughs> begin to waver up and down, and then the soldiers ground arms. And either they just go away, or they even, if their officers try to make them, shoot, they'll shoot their officers, and then the state goes down. So it's northern Punjab you really have to wonder about. And there, as I say, I don't think that actually land reform is a critical issue anymore. The key role is played now not by great aristocrats, but by smaller local figures, maintaining their grip on the countryside through a mixture of patronage and kinship. Why do people, the overwhelming majority of income comes from the towns, makes such a point of maintaining a position in the countryside. Well, it's partly snobbery. <laughs> they just love at dinner parties and cocktail parties in Lahore uh, to talk about my village, which doesn't mean the village where I have a house. It means my village. They just love that. <laughs> um, you know, my, my villa in Gulberg just doesn't hack it from that point of view. But the other point is the, that the countryside has their kinship base. It has their kinship vote bank. Uh, and they use the money they extract from urban rents and from the state to maintain their, kin their hold on their kinship base in the countryside. But that's not because they have very large land ho holdings. The farms, uh, you know, a, a big farm in Punjab is now rather pathetic by the standards of, well, great land holding in Europe in the past, or certainly in Punjab. Um, but, 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 and yes, I mean, and, and you know, if the Islamists prevail, God forbid, in, in Punjab, uh, it will be for other reasons, which I'll come to in a second. Um, Fata, yes, I entirely agree, absolutely. But equally, you are quite right to say that um, it's, it's not at all clear what a majority of people in Fata want. I mean, it's very difficult, of course, at present to find out what people in Fata want because of the impossibility of going there to most of it. Um, and so you sort of pick up things which people will tell you in a shower or whatever. But certainly, well, you find again and again that the, um, there is not much enthusiasm for coming under the Pakistani regular administration and judicial system. So if one could negotiate some kind of compromise there. Equally, I agree with you that in the long term, the future has to involve incorporation into Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. Nothing, nothing else makes sense. Um, moving, uh, oh yes, and um, yeah, the, the long term, absolutely, ecological disaster. I come back to that again and again. And the terrifying thing about the World Bank report of 2004 and the subsequent reports that have come out of that are that they posit a disastrous situation a few decades down the line um, if really serious action is not taken over water use and the condition of water infrastructure. They posit that before one factors in the potential, but as yet unknown, effects of climate change. In other words, things are heading towards a disaster even without climate change. If you add climate change to that, things begin to seem very bleak indeed. And the, um, and the second thing, quite right, if, if indeed the patronage runs out altogether, then yeah, the system breaks down. Um, so far it hasn't, but who knows. That brings me to China. Um, my sense is, I'm, I'm sorry you've had to hear, hear this before, <laughs> this morning, is that you're absolutely right. The Chinese have been very cautious. All the business of trying to increase China's role has been coming from the Pakistani side. The Chinese, very reticent indeed. Um, and yes, I mean, China, that's not just the state, which doesn't want more tension with America. Um, it's also Chinese business, which 
you know, sees all the problems of working in Pakistan. I do think, though, that the Chinese, at least according to think tank people I've talked to, would in the last resort step in to preserve the existence of the Pakistani state. Curiously enough, most likely in a kind of de facto alliance with Saudi Arabia, a Saudi-Chinese alliance of all things. Um, because both countries, the Saudis and the Chinese, for their own reasons, see the survival of Pakistan as a, a, a vital interest in the case of Saudi Arabia, an important one for China. But that doesn't mean that they're going to pour enormous fortunes into you know, building Pakistani infrastructure or whatever or whatever. So th th this Pakistani dream of replacing America with China, I think, is just that. It's a pipe dream. And in fact, it's not one that they themselves are actually putting any serious effort into it. The number of, of Pakistanis who are learning Chinese, well, the ones I've met and I've traveled extensively at Pakistani universities can literally be, be, be numbered on the fingers of one hand, literally. Whereas the number of Pakistanis who, if they're in the elites, have second homes or often, in effect, first homes in London, uh, or if they're from extensive sections of the masses, have cousins in Bradford or Manchester or indeed Oslo, can be numbered on millions of hands. <laughs> so they're all learning English, not Chinese, still, is what I'm saying. Um, Afghanistan, first of all, just one thing. You said you contrasted the military and its attitudes to the Afghan Taliban uh, with a civilian government more interested in stability. Forgive me, but I think by that you mean a PPP government. Because after, you know, after all, <laughs> there is an opposition in Pakistan which looks highly likely in some combination to come to power after the next elections. Now, obviously, the PMLN, how sincerely or whatever, who can say, um, but has tried to distance itself more from America and has played some very dubious games with the Islamist extremists. Imran Khan, of course, has come out absolutely explicitly for a peace settlement with, well, a peace settlement with the Afghan Taliban, obviously within Afghanistan, um, and for a peace settlement with the Pakistani Taliban within Pakistan. Um, he's saying that, no doubt, because he believes it uh, himself, but also because he is appealing to a mass of the population in northern Punjab and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa who believe strongly in these things. So you see, what, what I'm saying is, there are very strong mass democratic forces in Pakistan, including large parts of the Pakistani media, uh, who also have great sympathy with the Afghan Taliban, uh, not, and who deeply dislike the, the fight with the Pakistani Taliban. Um, and in the case of the Afghan Taliban, that's not because they support them ideologically. Uh, it's because they regard them as akin to the Afghan Mujahideen of the 1980s. They regard them as a legitimate resistance force mm -hmm against a foreign occupation of their country, engaged in, in Muslim terms, a defensive jihad, which is incumbent on all Muslims to support. So what I'm saying is the Pakistani military does certain things, yes, for strategic reasons, but it also does things because this is, frankly, the democratic will of the Pakistani people, which they have to worry about going against. Because I was talking at the foreign ministry this morning, how, after all, this is what people think in the town think very, very strongly in the towns and the villages where the ordinary soldiers are recruited. Um, as far as peace with the Pakistani Taliban is concerned, well, this is partly because of, I was also talking about this adult sense that, you know, that most of them are just good, good Muslim kids and that the bad Taliban are backed by India. Uh, or even the United States. Now, this is partly the fault of the Pakistani military, which has put this out very, very strongly uh, in order to mobilize, you know, to try to maintain support and morale in its own ranks. Um, but, you know, I have to say, after many, many years of dealing with Pakistani journalists, and I say this as a journalist myself, and the British media can also be very, very bad from this point of view, but on the whole, I have to say, um, most journalists don't need outside forces to get them to believe ridiculous things. They're quite capable of doing it all on their own, <laughs> um, I find. Um, when it, yes, no, no, you're, you're quite right. I should have paid more attention to the Haqqani network. What this reflects in part, of course, is the fact that 
um, this is to a great extent a, a, a book, perhaps more than it should have been, but a, but a book based on uh, my own um, researches. Um, and I must candidly admit that I did not go off to northern Waziristan with a notebook <laughs> <laughs> and a camera. <laughs> um, uh, as you can see from the fact that my head remains on my shoulders rather than under my arm. Um, so I didn't talk to them. In fact, the last time I talked to, the, to people from the Haqqani network um, was when uh, they were, what was President Reagan's phrase? Heroes of freedom and democracy? In other words, I interviewed them when I was covering the Afghan Mujahideen back in the late 1980s. Um, a remarkably consistent people, by the way. Say what you like about old, old Haqqani. He has said and done exactly the same thing now for... I mean, against any enemy who turns up, uh, but with ruthless consistency uh, for 35 years. Um, th th that's why I, I don't think you're going to get the Haqqani network um, to agree to a peace settlement in Afghanistan involving the long-term presence of US troops. Uh, the extent of, Pak of Pakistani actual military training and support. Now here, I, I may have been over-influenced by you know, an, an unconscious, instinctive comparison with the Haqqani network in the 1980s and with the Afghan Mujahideen in the 1980s. Because of course, when I was going into Afghanistan with them, there was active and obvious support. I mean, not just from Pakistan, but also from us, you know, in terms of r sophisticated weaponry, major training, equipment, and so forth. Now, clearly nothing on that scale has occurred. How, the, the, the other thing is that when it comes to IEDs, yes, these have been getting more sophisticated. But the last time I went to a briefing on the subject by the British Ministry of Defense, they said that um, the IEDs are still relatively unsophisticated uh, compared to um, those being used, well, certainly by the Shia militias in Iraq in the past, uh, which would argue not for much state backing. And of course, then again, the Afghan Taliban have had a, a good deal of expertise coming to them via Al-Qaeda um, from, from Iraq. So that, it, it, I mean, it is damnably difficult to work out just the extent of Pakistani military involvement. And, of course, the problem is that every source you talk to is unreliable. Pakistanis, forgive me, are, are wholly unreliable on the subject. But then, of course, the Afghans uh, have a very, very strong motive for talking up Pakistani involvement as much as they possibly can. So, not sure on that score. Um, finally, uh, and f forgive me, I just have to repeat once again what I said in the morning. Um, conflicting interests of the US and Pakistan. It seems to me here two things need to be kept in mind. The first is that the, for me, well actually for all of us if we think about it, a vital and overriding US interest in that part of the world and Britain's, Norway's, is to prevent terrorism against us here in Oslo, in London, New York or whatever. That, that, after all, is why we're there. We're there because of 9-11. We didn't go in after 9-11. You know, the initial intention was not to build a democratic Afghan state or whatever or whatever. Went in because of 9-11. Everything else has been loaded onto this since. Now, the reason I say this is that in recent weeks, I've had meetings with very senior people in the relevant fields in America and Britain who told me that ISI cooperation against terrorist plots directed at the West, not, not inside Afghanistan, but terrorist plots directed at the West, has continued unchanged through the past year. Uh, through all the crises in relations, through breaking off other aspects of cooperation, this has continued. Reason A, Pakistani security establishment believes that it has national interests in, Af in backing the Afghan Taliban to some degree. Uh, nobody with any sense, if, if you're not actually an Islamist extremist, believes that they have any interest, national interest, in backing terrorism against the West. And on the other hand, of course, Pakistan has been warned very, very harshly indeed by American officials 
what would happen to Pakistan if there were a successful terrorist attack. So this cooperation continues, and as I've been told, not just recently but over the years, it has been of very, very great value. Uh, in Britain especially, identifying members of the Pakistani diaspora in Britain, going back to Pakistan for training, contacts with groups, and then returning to Britain. Information from Pakistan has been very, very important to identifying some of these people and allowing the British police uh, to, um, to get them. Uh, well, so here, in a, an absolutely vital area, interests remain convergent. Um, the second thing is that We have 15 minutes left. 15? Yeah. No, no, but <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good occasion because I want you to tell him. Yes, yes, yes. No, there, so <laughs> well done, me. well done. Okay, Thank I'll you finish much. it. But uh, as, to, uh, as to whether um, Pakistani and US uh, and our interests in Afghanistan could be convergent or not, that basically depends, your view, on whether you think the present US strategy in Afghanistan will work. If you think it will work, then... Re then interests with Pakistan are divergent. If you think it won't work, then in my view, well, obviously, you have to try for a political settlement in Afghanistan, at, at which point, actually, interests with Pakistan do become, in my view, convergent. The risk is, of course, that if, as far as Pakistan is concerned, but terrorism as well, that if, if America continues with its existing strategy, things could happen which would so radicalize opinion within Pakistan that there would be a general breakdown of relations, or even in the last resort, um, in certain very specific circumstances, a mutiny from below in the army. This is what I worry about in northern Punjab, not a social revolt from below. I mean, the Islamists will do better at the next elections, but most of the protest vote, it seems from existing polls, will go to Imran Khan. And Imran Khan, as we speak, is in the process of deal doing deals with the old political elites to get enough you know, support in the countryside and so to get into power. No, it's not that. Uh, it's that um, essentially a mixture of anti, the, the, the disastrous collision of, on the one hand, American actions and the anti-Americanism of the vast majority of the population will come together in ways which will destroy the prestige of the Pakistani state and of the Pakistani generals. And that for the first time in Pakistan, you will have some kind of military move which comes not from the chief of staff and the corps commanders, but from below. Now, if that happens, that's my scenario for how Pakistan could in fact fail in the next few years, as opposed to the next few decades. Thank you very much. Well, I, I have to admit, I've done a terrible job in trying to control the time. So, um, so it's all my fault. No, no, to I blame it on I my Italian half, uh, because you're <laughs> very bad in keeping things in special control. I promise one hour time for discussion, and we have ten minutes left. But I think what Professor Levin, I mean, he went into so many details that I think he, you know, um, it was, up, I mean, I didn't dare to cut it because it was just too interesting. I think probably covered so, ma so many things. In any case, maybe he responded to some of your questions. But um, yes, please, if you have questions left, then we are glad to take them in three at a time.